Grandpa stole his first buggy in 1892. Uh, I met your grandma pig slopping in 46. Oh, every Christmas we'd visit my Uncle Fred in prison. And welcome, Genies. It's America's Family History Show, Extreme Genes and ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth on the program where we shake your family tree and watch the nuts fall out. And this episode is brought to you by BYU TV's Relative Race, now in Season 5. Catch it Sunday nights at 9 o'clock Eastern, 6 o'clock Pacific. And coming up today, we've got some great guests, as always. First time I've ever done this, actually. Got a deep insider from Ancestry.com. He is John Erickson. He is the Senior Director of Product. And we're going to weasel out of him what we can expect in 2019 and 2020 as they develop their products. And how do they develop which particular databases that we're going to to get and and how they go through the process of digitization and how long it takes to get it digitized and then out to us. It's going to be an interesting visit with John in two parts coming up starting in about 10 minutes. Later in the show also, we are going to talk to Melanie McComb from NEHGS about Jewish records and how to get those name changes resolved in some cases. So that's going to be a lot of fun as well. Right now, though, let's head out to Boston and talk to David Allen Lambert. He is the chief genealogist of the New England Historic Genealogical Society and AmericanAncestors.org. Hello, David. Hey, Fish, how are you doing? I am awesome and ready to hear your family histoire news because I know you got a grundle of stories today. I do. I just want to quickly say hello to everyone from the New England Regional Genealogical Conference in Manchester, New Hampshire. All those genies from our show came over to say hi and want me to say a big hello to you. Okay, the first thing I want to talk about is how about a matriculation from college a hundred and a half years after you were supposed to graduate. This is the case of the Edinburgh Seven. These seven ladies were set to graduate back in the 1860s, but they were ruled by 1873 that they shouldn't even have gone to college, what? let alone had the right to graduate. Yeah. So the university in Edinburgh has now decided to right this old wrong and allow them to matriculate. Here's the big thing. Do you think any of their descendants are around to walk for them? Wow. They're dead. This is crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, better late than never. I know that I thought college would always kill me before I finish, but never thought it would kill you, (laughs) bury you, then decide to give you a diploma. Right. Uh, The stories you get from Scotland, including this one, which is about 105 years older. And this was on Scotland's people uh, on their Twitter feed, and I just had to share it. Because you know the way that sometimes you wonder why the person has recorded something kind of weird? How about this one? This is from 1704 from the parish of Ochiltree in Ayrshire, Scotland, where the registrar wrote down a baptism of a baby, or attempted to. Quote, the child's name was something, comma, George something, lawful son of what ye call him in Mains of Bark Skimming, was baptized on April 9, 1704. <laughs> so, apparently too much mead in the uh, the drink the night before. Yeah. He couldn't remember who they just baptized. Yeah, he punted, <laughs> apparently, yeah. <laughs> You know, I read a lot of the Family History News right from ExtremeGenes.com, so I really have to thank you for uh, holding up those cue cards for me. But this one's a great story. Right here from Massachusetts, Elizabeth Freeman was the first enslaved woman to sue for her freedom and actually win back in the 18th century. It's a great story, and it goes to show you, you know, that the rights of African Americans kind of started up north. Massachusetts had slaves until 1783. Well, it's a great story, and you need to read it. It's on ExtremeGenes.com. Well, speaking of Revolutionary War era news, you might have heard of the hero of the revolution, Casimir Pulaski, the person that was recognized as the father of the American U.S. Cavalry. Well, they're not saying that it's possibly the father, but now maybe the mother? Yeah. It's a condition known as congenital adrenal hypoplasia, which makes a girl more of a guy, or is it more of a guy, more like a girl? Well, in any event, they have dug up the great niece of Casimir, and they have the skull of Casimir who died here in the States, and they're doing the DNA, and it looks like the hero may actually be a heroine. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Casimir Pulaski, and their counties, and their cities, and, and even a nuclear submarine, David, you know, <laughs> Named after this guy. Yeah. 
Stay tuned as more DNA results unfold on yes. extreme genes. Yes, that, that, that is pretty extreme. Pretty interesting. I really think it is. And more to follow on this fun story. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Well, speaking of DNA, we've talked about family tree DNA, and of course, a lot of customers and a lot of DNA companies are concerned because their results are being given to law enforcement to identify uh, potential matches. Family Tree DNA has recently reached out to Ed Smart, whose daughter Elizabeth Smart was abducted at age 14, hoping to use uploaded DNA profiles to help catch a killer. And uh, it's an interesting marketing angle. Well, it is because there was so much controversy surrounding it, and Family Tree DNA has basically leaned into the controversy by running these ads. So we'll see how it works for them. Yeah, yeah, it's really fascinating. Like I say, more to help people find their ancestors, but also find the killer of their immediate family. It's terrible but useful information. Did you hear about that Zambian nurse? Yes. <laughs> this is a oh crazy my. story. I'm just going to summarize it here pretty quickly. Yeah. There's this Zambian nurse who's dying of cancer, and she's on her deathbed, and she's confessing that over many, many years, she swapped 5,000 babies for, for fun, for fun. Yeah, she said this is what she did for entertainment, and it became kind of a habit. And so basically there are probably 5,000 families or so out there that are actually raising or have raised children that belong to some other family that's out there raising somebody else's kid. So it'll be interesting to see if there might be some need for DNA testing going on in Zambia anytime soon. My heritage needs to get down there and offer free DNA kits and see how many families they can have. Yeah. Crazy story. uh, It really is. Well, I hope that all of our listeners are members of American Ancestors. And if you're not, the New England Historic Genealogical Society would love to have you as a member. And you can use the checkout code EXTREME and save $20 on your membership. All right, David. Thanks so much. And we will talk to you again next week. Yeah, and have fun talking to Melanie. She's a brilliant genealogist. Coming up soon. Take care. And coming up next, I'm going to talk to John Erickson. He is the Senior Director of Product for Ancestry.com. What databases and products do we have to look forward to coming up from Ancestry in the coming couple of years? We'll find out next in three minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Roots Tech 2019 may be over, but the Family History Fund doesn't have to end. Visit RootsTech.org to view recorded content from the event. Rewatch the inspiring keynote addresses from celebrity speakers Patricia Heaton, Saru Briley, and Jake Shimabukuru. A number of classes are also available to view for free from popular genealogists such as Miko Cleland, Diane Southard, and Valerie Elkins. Want access to even more content from Roots Tech? Purchase the virtual pass and get access to 18 recorded conference sessions. Watch playbacks from any device from the comfort of your own home. Enjoy exclusive content from popular presenters like Kenyatta Berry, D. Joshua Taylor, and Lisa Louise Cook. Purchase your all-access virtual pass at rootstech.org for only $129. Roots Tech 2019 may be over, but it lives on through the Roots Tech virtual pass. Download yours today. Visit rootstech.org to learn more. Hey, Genies, it is Fisher here, and Season 5 of BYU TV's Relative Race is halfway through. Yeah, Episode 5 for Day 5 just completed last weekend, and once again, it was pretty dramatic and entertaining. And what was interesting about it is maybe the most emotional moment wasn't for any member of any one team. Instead, it was for a relative of Marcus from Team Green, the second cousin to his dad, who actually had been the DNA link to his father, who he met in the first episode, And she found out who her family was. As usual, a lot of emotion and a lot of fun, too, with the Plain Poppers Challenge. What is it? How does it work? You'll have to see the episode. You can stream it, of course, using the BYU TV app or watching on BYUtv.org. It's on Sunday nights at 9 o'clock Eastern, 6 o'clock Pacific. Episode 6 for Day 6 coming right up this Sunday night. Which relatives will our teams meet this coming week? Find out on Relative Race on BYUtv. 
Legacy Tree Genealogists is a proud sponsor of Extreme Genes. Based in Salt Lake City, Utah, near the world's largest family history library, we've worked with genealogists all over the globe since 2004 to track down records, find your ancestors, and the stories that bring your legacy to life. We also analyze DNA test results, help you join lineage societies, and find missing cousins. Legacy Tree is the recommended research partner of MyHeritage.com and is the world's highest client-rated genealogy firm. Call us toll free at 1-800-818-1476 or register online to get a free estimate right now you can save up to 100 on professional genealogy research but hurry this offer expires at the end of the month even experienced researchers can benefit from our proven and experienced staff of specialists who can bring new approaches to old problems learn from our free genealogy tips on our blog at legacytree.com slash blog legacy tree genealogists we do the research you enjoy the discoveries Welcome back, Genies. It is Fisher on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show, and ExtremeGenes.com. You know, the aftermath of Roots Tech brings us a lot of interesting interactions, and one of them for me at Roots Tech was visiting with the Senior Director of Products for Ancestry.com, John Erickson. And uh, we've never crossed paths before, but it was fascinating to hear some of the things he did, and he's kind enough to say, hey, yeah, let's go on and talk about what they're doing there right now, because as so many people have have ancestry accounts it's it's kind of good to know what the direction they're going in and get to know some of the people behind the scenes there at ancestry that have our best interests as family history researchers in mind and uh, john welcome to extreme genes great to have you thank you so much scott it's great to be on how did you get started in all this yeah so that's a great question so i'll split that into two parts first was my kind of interest in family history and then second was what brought me directly to ancestry itself my parents were both avid, avid genealogists and continue to be. And there was two things that really stood out in my mind in my youth that really blossomed an interest in family history for me. The first of them was an opportunity I had when I was young to be able to go overseas with my parents and travel to Wales. And we were able to, I was very fortunate to be able to go with them. And we did a, a week-long houseboat trip on the Brecon Beacon Canal and stopped in little towns along the way where we were able to go down into the town, go to the local cemetery and be able to look at gravestones for people that were um, in my direct ancestry. And that experience really highlighted for me the value and understanding the past that we came from. So that was one experience that really drove this interest to me. The other was when my grandfather passed away, um, my, my mother's father, he died in a plane crash in St. George in the, in the early 1990s. And it was then that I really began to understand not only the, the people that were in my tree, but the stories behind them and really got to know my grandfather better through the, the stories of the family that got together and, and came together to celebrate his life. And that really had a profound impact on me. And so I carried that with me through my career in product management and over the course of 10 or so years working in, in product management, specifically in healthcare, the opportunity came up for me to be able to join Ancestry. Wow. Uh, and I jumped at the opportunity because Ancestry and family history in general is such a mission-driven enterprise. And I had been in healthcare for so long because that was important to me. I wanted to be able to work on problems that were really important to helping individuals and the quality of life. And that's where healthcare really stood out for me. And then, as I said, the ability to join Ancestry, which was a completely different problem set, but still very mission-driven, oh, yeah. was something that I, I jumped at. And so I made that move about 10 months ago and have not looked back since. Boy, I, I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, you're our kind of person. You're a genie first and foremost, and then you have the skills to kind of figure out exactly uh, how to get a hold of some of these record sets. Now, you oversee you know, all the product lines and, and things that are happening at Ancestry. How do you select what record sets you go after? Yeah, so great question. And so I work closely with the family history product line here and with our content team, which is an absolutely extraordinary team. And they are really focused on kind of three tiers of content to go after. First and foremost are what we call our, our kind of core records. Basically, these are records around birth, marriage, death, and census records. The records that are so vital to being able to uncover our past. 
Mm -hmm. And so we have uh, an extensive effort in continuing to to find records like that that we can digitize and bring uh, into our system. We also have records that expand on the stories of people's lives. So birth, marriage, death, and census are great to be able to find individuals, to find their parents, and to be able to, to research back. Sure, in our extend trees. the tree, right. Exactly. But then there's a whole record set that really adds richness to the stories of those individuals' lives. So those are things like immigration records, military records, records around directories and things like that that provide that context to the time and place that the individual lived in. And then the third record set that we have are records that help individuals in areas where we don't have lots of historical records to better understand the time and place of those populations. So if we can't, because of whatever reason, find birth, marriage, death, et cetera, but we have people who have done their DNA and have ethnicities or, or communities in certain regions where the BMD records might be sparse, we try to find records that might add color and understanding to, to that time and place and region that they may be from. So it's so a little historical background kind of thing? Exactly. Yeah, things that provide insights for those populations. So, you know, we hear this a lot. People are thinking, well, if it's not online, it doesn't exist, or I shouldn't even make any effort to look at it, or it's going to appear somewhere. What is your guesstimate as to what percentage of the records are still out there that nobody has, has, has gone and digitized up to this point? I, I wish I had a number for you. I don't. I don't. We have not tapped out on those resources at all. Um, there are some records that we know are available and that for some reason just have not been made available from a digitization perspective. Mm -hmm. And so we're actively pursuing those record sets to try and get those. And sometimes that's just a matter of the clock passing long enough where government agencies can release those things. For instance, censuses are a great example of that, where every 10 years we can add a new census collection based on, on the legal requirements of that set. There's others that we are aware of that uh, we're unsure about the, the status of when we would be able to get those. We're in constant contact with organizations to try and get uh, updates on those statuses and work with them to get those. And then there's some that probably have not been discovered, but that we're actively looking to discover. Sure. Um, so I don't I, I wish I had a number to put on that, but the number is substantial enough that we'll be doing this for quite some time. Yeah, for quite a long time. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think there's any risk of you being out of work anytime soon when it comes to finding records, is there? Exactly. No, there's not. And what about indexing? I'm, I'm sure people would be curious exactly how it is. You obtain these records, and still, in order to become searchable, there has to be a process that you go through. Yeah, we have quite an extensive process for the digitization of our records. It begins by identifying the records that we want to acquire, working with the appropriate agencies to get the, the appropriate contracts in place. Um, and then we begin the digitization process which includes all the necessary work to you know, take photographs of it, clean the records up, do the indexing for those, add relevant uh, information to make that information, to make those records searchable, get those records in various sizes to be appropriate for different consumption platforms like desktop versus mobile, et cetera, and then publish those to our site, stitch those into our, our database to make them searchable and to make them a part of a, our hint system. So there's quite an extensive process wow. that, uh, yeah, that has people going, you're going night and day working to get these records to our customers. Hey, I'm just hearing a lot of meetings in my mind. <laughs> Once you talk about that, it's like, I don't think so. I don't think I'd want to do that. So let me ask you about the timeline then. So from the time, say, you digitize something, maybe on site, maybe you're in New York, maybe you're in Los Angeles, maybe you're in the South someplace, from the time you actually digitize something, Till the time you've cleaned all this up, you've done the indexing, and you get it online, what is the usual timeline for this? Yeah, so it's completely dependent upon the size of the record set. Um, so we'll, we will get something like a census, which will be rather comprehensive, and then we'll get smaller record sets that are for a specific parish, for instance. And so it really is dependent upon the size of the collection. It can range from months to over years. And so wow. uh, it's something we are, yeah, we're, we have really tuned that experience to be as efficient as possible. And we continue to work to, to improve it so that we can make that as fast as, as possible. But it is a pretty comprehensive process, as you can imagine. And so 
for, uh, you know, especially our larger record sets, it can take quite some time. So do you ever see a time where handwriting will be done automatically when it comes to the indexing or even translation of old records uh, in, in foreign languages? Yeah, handwriting is a fascinating topic, and it's something that we are are actively working at. Um, as you can imagine, as anyone who's sat down and done any sort of indexing for old records, um, handwriting across the across decades and centuries goes through quite dramatic changes. And so it's a very complex problem, um, but one that we hope to be able to solve. Um, that would definitely be the desired end state for us is to be able to scan those handwritten records and be able to get with strong accuracy be able to digitize that and, and translate that into searchable text. So is, something is that, that we're, done at all yet to any degree at all? Um, on handwritten records, uh, not from a production, not at, not at large production scale for us at this point in time. Okay. So over time. What about with foreign languages? In, uh, in what perspective? It, what, do you Will think, we be looking at that you, as well? Do you think you would be able to translate those as well? I mean, obviously, some languages like uh, with the Russian, for instance, is completely different than what the characters are in English. Uh, do you think that there, th- that would be probably much even further down the road? Yes. Yeah, so definitely English would be where we would start to tackle the problem, but the goal would be to be able to do that for multiple languages. Wow. I mean, it just, it just kind of blows my mind. So do you ever take input from some of your customers as to where record sets might be that you'd be able to go get? Always, yeah. So we have in the past surveyed customers in terms of what records uh, they would like from what countries. And we also keep very close track on the searches that people are performing and what countries that we have significant representation of within our trees. So we track data from as many points as we can to try and get a sense of where we can bring more record sets in to be able to help people bust their brick walls and to be able to further the research on their trees. So yeah, we, we look at all sorts of data to be able to do that. All right. We're going to take a break, John. We're going to be back with John Erickson. He is the Senior Director of Products at Ancestry.com. We're going to talk about ties of records into DNA, some of the things going on there. Census records coming up again here pretty soon. What's going to happen with that project when we return in five minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Looking for an easy way to show off your family history and share it with your family? Family Chart Masters offers beautiful custom pedigree art pieces and inexpensive family reunion draft charts in any design or size that fits your needs. With a free consultation at FamilyChartMasters.com, you can get started creating a new family masterpiece. Family Chart Masters has over 11 years of experience in creating and printing family charts. They can print any style genealogy chart from any genealogy file and can create exactly what you're looking for. You'll work with a specialized and talented consultant whose goal is to make you happy. Decorative charts make fantastic gifts for all occasions. And with Family Chart Masters' option of ordering duplicate charts at half price along with your original purchase at full price, you can afford to give a family heirloom to each member of your family. Contact Family Chart Masters today at FamilyChartMasters.com for your free consultation. Family Chart Masters will give the greatest care to your family history. Scientific studies have proven that youth who know even a little bit about their family history perform better academically and have a greater sense of personal confidence and stability. Genealogy is its own incredible superpower that arms our children with super strength. But how do you get your child or grandchild interested in studying their family history? That kind of stuff is just for grandmas, right? Not anymore. Zap the GrandmaGap.com leaps the generation gap in a single bound. Author Janet Havorka provides you with useful and timely advice on helping the young people in your life become engaged in their own family history. Janet has an entire collection of books to inspire the young and the young at heart in fun, interactive ways. She also offers creative tips and advice on her blog and in her free weekly newsletter. Stop by ZapTheGrandmaGap.com today to sign up for Janet's free email newsletter with 52 weeks of easy tips, free downloads, and order your set of resource books and workbooks. (laughs) 
All right, back at it on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show, and ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth. And I'm talking to the Senior Director of Products at Ancestry.com. He is John Erickson. And we're finding out about some of the things we can anticipate coming out sometime soon. Well, John, this year and next year are in your perusal at this point. And what can you tell us? Okay, what can I pry out of you (laughs) about (laughs) this coming 12 months or so? Yeah, so I would say there's two things that are coming this year. Two, well, I'll say three things coming this year that I think are extremely exciting. First one is something that we talked a little bit about at Roots Tech, which is our obituary collection. We are working with all of the content available on newspapers.com to be able to scan through every page of newspaper content that we have and to use machine learning algorithms that our data science team has come up with to be able to extract the obituaries from every single page of newspapers.com content. And so that's over 400 million different pages wow. that we'll be looking if we can find an obit and be able to extract the data from that o- obituary and provide that to our ancestry subscribers. And so, as, as you know, these obituaries are mini family trees in and of themselves. They don't just contain information about the deceased. They contain information about the deceased children and the deceased parents and other relationships that are really core to being able to make those discoveries. And so when this project is done, we will release that and be able to claim the largest obituary database or index in the world. Wow. And then ultimately, you could see it through newspapers.com. Yeah, exactly. So the relationships that are extracted will be a part of the ancestry. So you'll be able to see the name of the deceased. You'll be able to see the relationships and be able to add those discoveries to your family tree on Ancestry. If you want to read the actual obituary itself, you can go to newspapers.com to be able to read the, well, that's, the obituary. And that's so fun to actually have the, uh, the image of it as well. So what else is coming out? So Obits is our first collection. The second one is an expansion of our yearbooks collection. The thing I love about yearbooks is I've been able to find pictures of my parents, my grandparents, and even my great-grandparents in our yearbook collection, which has been just an amazing set of discoveries for myself. What we're doing with those is we've completely revamped our algorithm to be able to identify the faces and connect those with names. We will be adding about 100,000 additional yearbooks to bring the total to about 420,000. And that covers almost all of the 1900s, from 1900 up to the 1990s, and potentially even some into the early 2000s. And so an expansive addition to that record set, as well as um, increased usability and increased discoverability within those records themselves. So they're actually using facial recognition now with the old yearbooks? So it's not facial recognition, because facial recognition is more specific to being able to say this face belongs to this individual. What we're doing is being able to scan through and be able to tie the written text in the yearbook with the face itself a bit better than we currently do. So continuing to refine those algorithms so that when you search for an individual, you'll be able to be taken to a picture of that individual from the yearbook, you know, with a box around it just to help you hone in on that. Right now, wow. often you'll search and will bring you to the yearbook page. But you, you'll have to then kind of hunt around to see if you can recognize the individual that you're looking for. So this will work to make that even more accurate going forward. So this thing's going to figure out, OK, here's the back row and fifth from the left. And that's that's phenomenal. <laughs> this has got to keep yeah, some of your scientists up at night. Exactly. It'll start with the individual photos we have. But then, yes, we'll be looking at ways that we can do that with the group photos that we have. Unbelievable. One more on on 2019 that we're looking to do before we get to 2020 will be a significant set of records from uh, New York City. So the New York City certificate indexes for birth, marriage, death, those we're digitizing. And that'll be about 20 million records we'll be adding that range from around 1862 to 1949. Uh, So very excited to be able to add those. And then actually on top of that, there's a lot for 2019. Um, on top of that, we'll be <laughs> wow. Yeah, on top we'll be finishing the digitization of the World War II draft cards. There's 33 million of those. We just released 4.6 million from seven states just a month or so ago, six weeks ago. And by the end of the summer, we plan to have all 33 million of those complete, as well as some uh, digitizing U.S. naturalization records from California, Delaware, New York. Pennsylvania, Virginia, and West Virginia. Wow. You're a busy man. <laughs> our, t- our teams are busy for sure. Um, and <laughs> all of this is made possible through 
our amazing content organization, which is just absolutely dedicated to bringing these records to life for individuals as quickly and as accurately as possible. That's awesome. All right, 2020. So 2020 will continue core investments in both U.S. and international records. So I could say right now we're currently working on projects in multiple states. So we have work going in Hawaii, Montana, North Dakota, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and several other states, active digitization projects going on there that will be added to the database through 2019 into 2020. We also have work that's going on on census and BMD records in 15 different countries. So Australia, Austria, Canada, Denmark, Finland, France, Germany, Ireland, Latvia, Mexico, Netherlands, New Zealand, Norway, Sweden, and and the United Kingdom. Um, So all corners of the globe that we are undergoing current digitization and indexing projects that we'll see pop up on the site over the course of the next 18 months. So what story have you heard, John, that's come back to you from some record set you guys have discovered that really touched you, that you just went, wow, aren't we doing a great thing here? Yeah, great question. So I'll share two stories that touch me specifically. Both of those actually come through the content that we have at newspapers.com as I've been seeking to add that richness to my, my family tree. So they come from a sister site, but they're really important stories for me. And I'll I'll tell you why. So the first one was, as I was working to build out my father's profile on Ancestry, I did a quick search and I found an article in which he had won a flower arranging competition at a county fair when he was growing up. He was about uh, 14 and I just thought that was the most interesting thing that my dad, who <laughs> like, I would not put flower arranging in his skill set at all, not only competed, but won $5 in this competition in Riverside, California. So that discovery in and of itself was fun and exciting. But what really made it interesting to me was I, I shared that story with my daughters. I have three daughters and a son. And I was talking with, with two of my daughters about family history. And I told them this story. And we got on the phone with my dad to ask him about it. And the conversation that we had really sparked in my kids an interest in family history. The other story was the discovery of my great-great-grandmother and finding an article or an interview about her life. She had crossed the plains and was an early settler in Utah. And she talks about when her family got their first gas lamp and how they would sit around the table at night in awe over this gas lamp. And she also talked about, in kind of the same vein, her early fear of the automobile when the automobile first came out and how it took her years to gather the courage to be able to sit in an automobile. But she finally gathered the courage. And so those two things not only brought context to the kind of the time and place she lived in, but also to know that she was this tough person. And that drove home to me this really important message, which is our ancestors are not dates. You know, our ancestors are people that had lives, that had stories, that had experiences. And that's my quest to really get to know these people that I never knew and to find that richness in each of their stories and to help our customers find that richness in the stories of their ancestors as well. He's John Erickson. He is the Senior Director of Products at Ancestry.com. Great stuff, John. Thanks for all the information and the great work. And we look forward to seeing what you come up with next. Thank you so much, Scott. And up next, in three minutes, I'll be talking with Melanie McComb about Jewish research and tips for your journey coming up on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Legacy Tree Genealogist is a proud sponsor of Extreme Genes. Based in Salt Lake City, Utah, near the world's largest family history library, we've worked with genealogists all over the globe since 2004 to track down records, find your ancestors, and the stories that bring your legacy to life. We also analyze DNA test results, help you join lineage societies, and find missing cousins. Legacy Tree is the recommended research partner of MyHeritage.com and is the world's highest client-rated genealogy firm. Call us 
toll free at 1-800-818-1476 or register online to get a free estimate. Right now, you can save up to $100 on professional genealogy research. But hurry, this offer expires at the end of the month. Even experienced researchers can benefit from our proven and experienced staff of specialists who can bring new approaches to old problems. Learn from our free genealogy tips on our blog at LegacyTree.com slash blog. Legacy Tree Genealogists. We do the research. You enjoy the discoveries. Roots Tech 2019 may be over, but the Family History Fund doesn't have to end. Visit RootsTech.org to view recorded content from the event. Rewatch the inspiring keynote addresses from celebrity speakers Patricia Heaton, Saru Briley, and Jake Shimabukuru. A number of classes are also available to view for free from popular genealogists such as Miko Cleland, Diane Southard, and Valerie Elkins. Want access to even more content from Roots Tech? Purchase the virtual pass and get access to 18 recorded conference sessions. Watch playbacks from any device from the comfort of your own home. Enjoy exclusive content from popular presenters like Kenyatta Berry, D. Joshua Taylor and Lisa Louise Cook. Purchase your all-access virtual pass at RootsTech.org for only $129. Roots Tech 2019 may be over, but it lives on through the Roots Tech virtual pass. Download yours today. Visit RootsTech.org to learn more. Hey, Genies, Fisher here with a shout out to our Patrons Club members at patreon.com slash extreme genes. This is where friends of the show support extreme genes for as little as a dollar a month, all the way up to the cost of a very nice burger each month. I mean, a really juicy one. You can support the show and enjoy various special Patrons Club member benefits, such as acknowledgement on extremegenes.com, special bonus podcasts from expert guests like Maureen Taylor, the photo detective, C.C. Moore, your genetic genealogist, great storytellers and experts on record sets from all over the world. We even offer expert advice on specific questions challenging your research. So go to patreon.com slash extreme genes and get signed up. We love sharing your genealogical journey with you on our Extreme Genes Patrons Club. After all, what would you rather have, inspiring and informative content or another greasy burger? The choice is yours. And thanks for supporting Extreme Genes. All right, back at it, talking family history on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show, and ExtremeGenes.com. I am Fisher, your radio root sleuth, and it's time we head out back to Boston to talk to my good friend, Melanie McComb. She is a genealogist for the New England Historic Genealogical Society and AmericanAncestors.org. She specializes in Jewish research and Irish research. I mean, she is a specialist in all ways. And Welcome to the show. Just thrilled to have you. Oh, thank you. I'm thrilled to be here. You know, I've been thinking about Jewish ancestry because we haven't spent a lot of time on that over the years. And I think it's really important to touch on it because of the fact there have been a huge number of Jewish immigrants, especially in the last 100 to 125 years. Obviously, there have been Jewish Americans really here from the beginning, even back in colonial times. But the bulk of people coming over from Jewish background have been in that last century to century and a quarter. Absolutely. With World War One, World War Two, especially with World War Two, is really where we started seeing people that were fleeing, especially Germany and Austria and the other annexed areas that were being taken over. You know, they were fleeing for their lives coming over to America. So we definitely see a large volume of people coming over to come over to ports like Boston and New York. And and what are the best records then for people who are researching these fairly recent immigrants? Sure. So one of the first lines I like to point people to is looking at some of the earlier census records, so roughly around 1910, because that gives you an idea with when they came over. You want to get a rough idea of when they came over to America to narrow down the possible year to find any kind of passenger records. And then from there, you want to see if, if they actually became a citizen. And those are noted as well in the census records. If they had filed their first papers, you'll see that commonly. And that's usually when they submit their declaration of intention that they declare they want to become a citizen um, and they plan to go through the naturalization process. Those papers are usually done either shortly after they came off the boat or usually in about two years of coming to America. Now, so for, the, can, for the more recent ones, though, like those you mentioned earlier who came over later just before World War II or just afterwards, is, is that a fairly easy thing to find as well without a census available? 
Yes, absolutely. Even if you don't have the census available, what's really nice is you can usually use websites like Family Search or Ancestry, and you can actually look in the county records for any, any of the petitions and naturalization certificates that were done to, to see if the family did become a citizen at some point. So that's one way to look at it is you can actually go into the county records and then see if they ever applied to become a citizen. And if they didn't apply, you can still find the family through pastor manifest records if you have an idea of what port they might have came through. There's a, there's a lot of great sites out there, like Steve, uh, Steve Morse's site, you know, where you can actually do a search and it'll actually search across the different microfilm of different passenger list records and actually see if you can find your, the family in the pastor list. And if you have an idea of what port they came in, that's really the key, because the port ultimately, where they came from and also where they ended up, will drive what kind of records you find. For example, here at the, the Weiner Family Heritage Center here at NHGS, we have a number of different files that are actually done when people came over. There actually is a landing card section where you actually see an index card of the person coming over, and it'll say you know, what port they came from, who they're ultimately going to meet in America, uh, the name of the ship, maybe occupation, full details about their name, age, gender. And, and when you mention the name there, that makes me think immediately about a lot of the name changes that Jewish people went through when they got here. Do these cards give some clues to what the names may have originally been? So typically the cards are going to be the name that's actually recorded on the ship manifest. So one common myth we hear is that when people came through Ellis Island and other ports, that their names were immediately changed. And that's a myth. Okay, let's hold it right there then, because we're going into a whole new area here. Let's uh, continue this line, because I think name change is a big hurdle for a lot of Jewish families. And we're going to talk about that more coming up in three minutes when we return on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Looking for an easy way to show off your family history and share it with your family? Family Chartmasters offers beautiful custom pedigree art pieces and inexpensive family reunion draft charts in any design or size that fits your needs. With a free consultation at FamilyChartmasters.com, you can get started creating a new family masterpiece. Family Chartmasters has over 11 years of experience in creating and printing family charts. They can print any style genealogy chart from any genealogy file and can create exactly what you're looking for. You'll work with a specialized and talented consultant whose goal is to make you happy. Decorative charts make fantastic gifts for all occasions. And with Family Chartmaster's option of ordering duplicate charts at half price along with your original purchase at full price, you can afford to give a family heirloom to each member of your family. Contact Family Chartmasters today at FamilyChartmasters.com for your free consultation. Family Chartmasters will give the greatest care to your family history. When was the last time you heard your grandmother's voice or saw your family enjoying life back in the 1950s or 60s? If the reason is you haven't known what to do with your old recordings, videos, and films, here's your answer. The Multimedia Center in Salt Lake City. We brought in a video project to the Multimedia Center, and overnight they duplicated it to DVD so we could meet our deadline. The Multimedia Media Center, 2870 East, 3300 South, Salt Lake City. Open Monday through Friday, 10 to 6. Call 801-483-1717 or go to transferduplication.com. Genies, it's Fisher with exciting news. The Weekly Genie, the official newsletter of Extreme Genes, is here. It's your Monday morning briefing on what's happening in the world of genealogy and family history and on Extreme Genes. Get all the details of jaw-dropping stories of discovery and keep up with the latest techniques in family history research. Get to know more about your favorite Extreme Genes personalities. And it's free. Sign up for the Weekly Genie now at ExtremeGenes.com or the Extreme Genes Facebook page. And when you do, you'll receive David Allen Lambert's top 10 tips for beginning genealogists from the Chief Genealogist of the New England Historic Genealogical Society. Sign up today for the Weekly Genie.
We are back for our final segment this week of Extreme Genes, America's family history show and ExtremeGenes.com, helping you to figure out how to find your ancestors and learn their stories. And we're talking Jewish ancestry right now with Melanie McComb. She's a genealogist for the New England Historic Genealogical Society and AmericanAncestors.org in Boston, Massachusetts. And Melanie, we're just talking about this idea of the name changes. And I actually had a, a friend of mine reach out to me at one time. His name is Hyman. And we discovered that his ancestor was actually named Heimovich. And uh, we were able to put together a lot more information about his family tree as a result of it. How do you counsel people to figure out what the name was originally and what that can mean to their research overseas? Sure. Yeah. So, so I can give an example from, from my family. What I would like to recommend people do is to look for the naturalization paperwork for those petitions. And typically why I recommend that is they will actually list the original name that someone came over on the boat in addition to the name they're filing under. And that's exactly what we found when I helped my friend. Exactly, yeah. So, so it, and it can be a real great find. To give you an example from my family, my great-grandfather, my living grandmother's father, when he came over from Latvia, we always thought his name was always Eddie Gale. That was always a name that she knew him by. She never knew him by any other name. And I actually did some research and was actually able to find his petition for naturalization, and it listed his original name, and it was Anton Galunas. And Galunas was a very Lithuanian name. Uh, Lithuanians were going to Latvia based on the pogroms and just the, the persecution they were finding and more opportunities. So that kind of opened up like another way of, of looking for it. And that was clearly spelled out on the petition. And wow. sometimes that might be the only case you see that name change. Um, because a lot of times what was happening was when immigrants were coming to America, they were trying to assimilate. But we weren't required to go through a court necessarily to change their name. They might have just changed their name so that they could fit in amongst uh, their community and not necessarily be distinctively showing up as being a foreigner. Right. And that's what, and that's what happened with my great-grandfather. He was ultimately a jewelry engraver in New York City, and he ultimately just decided to change his name and went by Eddie Gale. So completely changed both first and last name, which I can see that happen sometimes. Well, it's interesting you mentioned that because as we identified this man's name, he went by Hyman, but his siblings continued to go by Hymovich. And now that we knew that, we were actually able to start putting together family groups and extract their history collectively and tie them together. And it made a really big difference in being able to sort this all out. This man had looked for years, could never figure it all out. But once we got that intention, it really changed everything. And I think to some extent, it's rather unique to Jewish heritage. Absolutely. I, I do find that that's more common amongst Jewish population compared to other populations. Like in my family, I also have the Irish side, my father's side. And you're right, they didn't really change their name so much. They might have swapped out their middle name for their first name. But you're right, they didn't really holistically change their entire name. Um, but we do see that with other populations. I have seen that with uh, Italians and other groups coming over from Europe where that actually was very common to just to, just to anglicize yeah. their name over time. But you're right, uh, Jews definitely did participate very actively in that practice. Yeah. Well, it's very helpful, and we appreciate you sharing uh, your expertise here, Melanie. And we're going to have to have you back on and talk about Irish history at some point oh, down the that. line as well. <laughs> happy, to always share, happy to always share some shamrocks with you. <laughs> hey, I love the sound of that. She is Melanie McComb. She's a genealogist with the New England Historic Genealogical Society and AmericanAncestors.org. Thanks for coming on, Mel, and we will talk to you again soon. Great. Thanks so much, Scott. Hey, that's a wrap for this week. Thanks once again to John Erickson, Senior Product Manager for Ancestry.com, for coming on and giving us a little insight as to which record sets we might be seeing here over the next couple of years. Some exciting things happening in that realm. Hey, don't forget, you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter. You can join us in our patron club and support the show and get some bonus podcasts each month, as well as early access to the podcast. And don't forget to sign up for our weekly Genie newsletter as well. We give you links to great stories and and past podcasts, and of course, a blog from me each week. Thanks for joining us. Talk to you again next week. And remember, as far as everyone knows, we're a nice, normal family. 